Today is uh, July 29th. Again, uh, we are doing first part of coding phase two demos. I'll do really quick introduction and then we will spend uh, the most of the time on uh, demos and discussions. Um, just to introduce the Google Summer of Code. Uh, so Google Summer of Code is uh, the world's biggest uh, open source uh, mentorship program. Uh, it has thousands of students each year and uh, the Jenkins project is proud to participate. Uh, it's our fourth year. And during the previous years, we had uh, a number of great projects. And this year, we have uh, seven active projects, uh, six uh, in uh, Jenkins uh, uh, and one in Jenkins X. Um, so yeah, that's basically the summary. Uh, just uh, to clarify, uh, this year we have two organizations participating in JSOC. One is Jenkins, uh, Jenkins umbrella organization for Jenkins and Jenkins X project, but also uh, our own umbrella organization, Continuous Delivery Foundation. It also participates in a Google Summer of Code. Uh, there are projects for Spinnaker uh, and Screwdriver. Uh, and if you go further, even Linux Foundation participates in JSOC. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot of organizations uh, this year. In our case, we present on the projects uh, in the Jenkins organization, and you can find the list here. So there is a uh, custom Jenkins distribution build service, machine learning uh, plugin, uh, Git performance uh, improvements, uh, YAML support for Jenkins Windows services, GitHub checks API, external fingerprint storage, and also uh, apps and uh, advanced standard edition for Jenkins X. So this is the projects uh, we have. Uh, right now we are three months uh, in the JSOC. So we had one month of community bonding and uh, two months of coding. And yeah, basically all projects are ready to be presented. We have uh, great demos to show. If you're interested in JSOC, uh, we have um, a public mailing list, we have Gitter, we have uh, not so regular office hours. So during the summer timeframe, usually we do them on demand if somebody is interested. Uh, but if you want to participate, uh, we're happy to host them. And also uh, every channel uh, we listed, uh, they have uh, their own project channels. So how to find them? You can go to our projects page. And here you can find all the information about the Google Summer of Code and Jenkins. So for example, if you're interested in custom Jenkins distribution build service, you go here, you can find project details, reference to materials, plans for your face, and also communication channels. All our projects uh, would appreciate uh, feedback and uh, evaluation by users. So if you're interested in them, please uh, use these channels to contact the teams. Okay. So what else uh, do we have? Uh, yeah, for Jenkins X, Jenkins X operates its, uh, in its own community channel. So if you're interested, uh, please join Slack. It's not on GitHub. The majority of our communication channels are um, on GitHub at this time. Okay, uh, before we proceed with demos, I would like to thank all uh, participants in JSOC. So it's uh, all students, mentors, org admins, and also all the reviewers and other community members who participated in uh, this year because yeah, we've got a lot of uh, um, feedback from uh, review, for example, from Jenkins core reviewers, plugin maintainers. We also got a lot of feedback from the developer mailing list, and, and hopefully, we will get a lot of feedback from users. So, thank Thanks to everyone who participates in JSOC this year. Uh, let's start with demos. So today we have uh, three demos. Uh, so with, uh, um, Git plugin performance improvements, GitHub checks API, and external fingerprint storage. The next uh, three demos will happen tomorrow at the same time. So if you're interested to know more about other projects, uh, please join us tomorrow. Um, for each demo, we will basically have a small introduction, a demo, and then discussion and q and So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. We are doing this meeting in Zoom, so basically everyone can unmute uh, yourself and ask questions. And uh, basically that's it. Uh, if you watch this recording and if you want to ask any questions offline, please use uh, our Gitter channel or the project channels, uh, which will be uh, communicated during the presentations as well. So that's it with introduction. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, then let's proceed with phase one uh, demos. I'll just stop sharing my screen. And uh, the first presentation is uh, by Sladen. Sladen, are you ready? 
Oh no, actually it's not sliding. Uh, it's uh, part, part one. one. Yeah, so it's a Git plugin performance improvements. Sorry. Thanks, Git. No worries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hope you all can share, see, uh, see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. This is the phase two review for uh, the Git plugin performance improvement project. Uh, I'm Rishabh Budholia. Uh, before starting, I'd like to thank my mentors. In this phase, uh, we've, we've tried to design a new feature and implement it, and their advice has been really helpful to me, and I'm glad that I'm working with them. So, um, a brief summary of what we have done uh, in the project. So uh, the singular aim of the project is to improve the performance of Git plugin. In phase one, the essence of phase one was to differentiate the uh, performance between the Git implementations we have inside the Git plugin, which is Git and JGit. So we used uh, benchmarking principles to do that, micro benchmarking principles, and uh, we use JMH as the framework to do it. It provides us the environment uh, to uh, design, implement, and analyze benchmarks. So we uh, implemented a module inside the Git client plugin to do that. Now, um, one of the major experiments we did was to compare the performance of uh, Git fetch as the Git operation for Git and JGit. And uh, what we found out was uh, that there is a strong correlation between the performance of Git fetch with the size of a repository. And uh, so what was not that obvious in, this, uh, in the results was that JGit's nature of performance changes after a certain size of repository. So if I have a size of repository, less than, uh, let's say less than 50, JGit would perform better than Git, but for more for a repository size, let's say greater than that, or let's say 400 or 500 MB, JGit's performance would exponentially degrade in those scenarios. So, uh, so we found out that during the phase one, and we also fixed the double fetch issue in the checkout step uh, for the Git plugin. Now, the second phase was about was about uh, implementing the insights we've gained from the benchmarks inside the Git plugin. And to do that, we've created a new functionality called the Git tool chooser, which is basically, it's going to recommend the optimal Git implementation. It's going to try to recommend the optimal Git implementation for a particular remote repository. The second thing we wanted to do was to expand the scope of benchmarking we are doing uh, for multiple repository parameters like branches, commits, or tags. And uh, we wanted to see the consistency of our results across multiple platforms. So I'll, I'll start with the Git tool chooser. So, so I've explained it's, it's, it's basically, it's going to recommend a Git implementation, which is going to be optimized on the basis of the repository uh, the plugin is using. And what does it need to do, do so? It's it either in your Jenkins instance, you have a branch source plugin like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or Gitty, or you can have a multi-branch project. Both of them, if you have any of them you have, you can use the functionality to improve performance. How? So this is a two-part answer. The first part is that, uh, so I've explained from the insight we've gained from the benchmarks that we have a size rule now. For a particular size, we, can, we know that which implementation is going to perform better than the other. So that is the first part. And the second part of the how is the uh, architecture of the class. So if you have a multi-branch pr uh, project within the Jenkins instance, we can, use, uh, we can use the cache stored in the workspace to estimate the size of the repository and then recommend you the optimal Git tool, which is the implementation. If you don't have that, if you don't have a multi-branch project in your instance, we could uh, we can use the, re the repository URL and then we depend on other plugins to ask the size of the repository uh, using REST APIs provided by GitHub, GitLab, or other service providers for Git. So, uh, so if you have that in your environment, we, we ask them for the size, they provide us the size. And if we have that, we would again, provide you the uh, recommendation. So I'd like to show you how that is going to happen. This feature has not been released yet. I have this, uh, this demo is going to be in my local machine. So, um, 
So I created two projects. Uh, I cannot show you a live demo because uh, profiling uh, to see the performance results, profiling it would take time. So, so I created two projects. Both of the projects, uh, as a user, I've chosen JGit as the implementation I want to choose uh, for a repository uh, which is Ruby, which is around 400, 500 MB. So now, what is happening? Uh, what is the difference between the projects? In this project, uh, I'm not uh, using the Git tool chooser. It's not there. And for the second one, um, we're using the Git tool chooser. So now, what is the difference? Uh, in terms of the uh, expectation for user. So in this project, I would, the, the class, the Git tool chooser would recommend Git instead of JGit, even if you've chosen JGit, because inside it would internally calculate that uh, J, uh, for this particular case, for a repository size, uh, such as 400 MB, Git would be a much better implementation than JGit. So what is the kind of difference we are seeing in performance? So I profiled this Jenkins instance um, using Java flight recorder. Uh, I attached it to the Jenkins instance. And so this is the, uh, this is the performance thread for uh, the project where we don't have the Git tool chooser. And what you see here is this is the thread execution for uh, Git fetch. It is taking around five minutes to execute that step which is uh, the majority of what the checkout step takes. Now with the introduction of Git tool chooser, what you'll see is that the fetch is going to take just a minute, less than two minutes. So uh, this is what is going to happen if we include this functionality within the Git plugin. But this will happen if you choose JGit as the uh, implementation to perform the Git operations. So, uh, this is, I think this is what the Git tool chooser wants to do. Now, there are some challenges which we've faced, which are facing. The first is that uh, we've discussed this, but still we, we want to see if we want to give the user an option at the global configuration level or at, uh, to a much uh, tighter scope to at, at a project level, if they want to implement this feature or not. Uh, the second is since we depend on other plugins to uh, to get the size we need to implement. So we have provided, we have exposed an extension point, which upon implementation can uh, communicate with uh, the REST APIs of those providers. So we need to implement that to have support across uh, GitHub, GitLab, Gitty, Bitbucket. The other challenge we have is that JGit doesn't support LFS checkout and shadow checkout. So we need to make sure that we don't recommend something which would break existing use cases. <clears throat> now, the second part of the project uh, of, of this phase, the progress is that we wanted to expand the benchmarking experiments we were doing. So the first uh, thing we did was that um, as of now, we've mostly tested any kind of Git operations performance with the size of the repository. In these experiments, what we tried was to keep the size of the repository constant and vary the number of branches, the number of commits, and the number of tags. So uh, with the first experiment where we vary the number of branches, what we see is similar to what we would see, similar in the sense that JGit's nature is similar uh, when we talk about Git, Git fetches performance with the um, with the repository size, vary the variation of repository size. It is changing, JGit is changing its nature after a certain increase in the number of branches, as you can see here. But uh, we can also see that for less than 100 branches, the, the, the performance overhead is, uh, is kind of negligible because the execution time we are measuring here is in milliseconds per operation. So uh, in terms of the whole plugin's performance, it would not make much difference when we are talking about branches, less than 100 branches. If you're talking about more than that, it would still at some point, maybe at half of a second, possibly. So, so we're not thinking of using this as a parameter to gain any actionable insight. Now, the second is with the, the number of commits. So what we can see is there the, the nature is different for both of the implementations. Uh, JGit is uh, JGit or Git. Both of them are not affected too much with the number of with the increase in the number of commits. As you can see, both of them are almost following a constant line. JGit is performing better than Git, though, so that is something here. 
the uh, third experiment was with uh, tags with tags what we see is that the correlation factor if there's like the quantitative uh, i would say the the, uh, the amount of how much uh, the number of increase in tags is affecting the performance of git fetch for both of the implementations is much higher than for branches or commits like we can see for a thousand tags or more than that there is almost half a second added to the operation git fetch so uh, so we would like to we would like to add this uh, to the current uh, to the current tool we have we would we we're not sure how we're going to add it right now because we need to make sure that uh, the experiments in the repository size are they are 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 they significant enough to not include this parameter or should we do that with that is something we have to explore these are the results with those parameters another experiment we did was to to check if the results we've gained from a single platform the benchmarks are they consistent across multiple platforms we needed to see that and that's important for us so so we compared the performance of uh, a git fetch operation using uh, a 400 size repository and the platforms we used uh, are windows freebsd 12 uh, an ibm workstation and s390x so so the most important observation here i'd like you all to concentrate on the second graph is the red line here so this red line marks the difference in performance between jgit and git and if you'll observe this line will almost remain constant for across all the platforms whether it's freebsd or it's an ibm workstation or windows so that makes us observe that uh, that our results, if we have in, if you have coded one of our benchmark results uh, on the basis of, let's say, a Linux instance, it would not vary. Our 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 estimation, our recommendation would not vary across multiple platforms, which is a great thing, I think. The next phase. So the next phase is the the most important thing for us is to release the features we've added in phase one and phase two. And that includes solving the current challenges we have. We need more test cases and uh, more support from other plugins. We need to implement those extensions, extension points we've provided. Apart from that, we'd like to explore other areas of Git plugin to improve the performance if we can find. And if we cannot and we have time, we might implement Git clone inside Git plugin. Currently, we do a Git init plus Git fetch step instead of Git clone. So we might look into that. We haven't discussed much about it. We would right now after uh, the, the start of this phase. So uh, yes, and uh, this is it from my side. Uh, any questions? Thanks for the summary. And it looks like there is a lot of research uh, for this project uh, going on. So yeah, my main interest would be about uh, the implementation and what has been already shipped to Jenkins users. Okay. I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, my question is the, when you compared fetch, fetching versus the number of branches for the performance, I, 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 it wasn't clear to me which one affected performance the most whether it was uh, it was one of your slides mm, you could um, yes this one so you you said you com comparing branches and tags yes you said one of them has a lot more impact on the performance yes. but it it wasn't clear to me which one with tags, we are seeing uh, a greater impact and how we can see that. So the Y axis is the execution time for Git fetch. It's in milliseconds per operation. But um, so if you see that for branches, for let's say practical size of branches, let's say 100, less than 500, we're not seeing much of a gain or, or of an overhead of performance. It's less than one fourth of a second. But with tags, if we increase the tags after a point, we would see uh, a gain of half a second or maybe more than that so um, to be more sure about it we would uh, I, I i would actually like to calculate 
so I've, I've used uh, in the research, I've used a factor called the, uh, the Pearson correlation coefficient, which would quantify the relationship if there's a linear relationship between the, the, the two parameters we're discussing here, the first being the tags and the second being the uh, git fetch performance, it would quantify the uh, relationship between them. And then we might be able to more confidently say what kind of impact it is uh, showing. Yes, Martin. Thank you. And I think though it's maybe important to note that those are like to compare like the impact with size, which was from the, the earlier phase, I guess. I guess it's not a comparison with size, but size has been the primary thing that, that uh, Rishabh has been looking at. And then this is looking at additional factors. And then in terms of platforms, primary development's been on Linux and Mac. So like uh, those other platforms were to also make sure that we would, because we were seeing those on Mac and Linux already, wanted to explore and make sure that those were on Windows and PowerPC. Thanks. I think that's it from my side. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? So, yeah, I would still be interested to know more about uh, the plans for release. So maybe clarify what are the next steps, because yeah, it looks like a great addition. Um, but yeah, as a user, I'm definitely looking forward to try it out. Oh, one more question here. You said you had removed the duplication and fetching. Was that a coding phase one activity? Yes, it was. I was okay. re recapping what we've done uh, for phase one. Okay. And the, the next one you said possibly look at Git clone versus, you know, implementing clone versus letting it do a bunch of fetches. Uh, so you're also, you're also thinking there might be performance improvements there? Uh, uh, we haven't compared Git clones performance versus Git fetch, but actually that's an interesting thing we could do. Right now we were just thinking that uh, we, we do uh, clone a repository, but we actually perform a Git init plus Git fetch there. So um, that's something I, I, I would explore. I, I haven't compared both of them what is their performance? Yeah, so, we, we have. Yes, yes, Mark, yes. We have anecdotal information from uh, one or more bug reports in JIRA, which claim that the, the choice to use git init plus git fetch is actually less efficient than using git clone. Now, I my benchmarking that I did two or three years ago on, on that bug report did not support the assertion that the bug report was making, but we have users who say clone is faster than init plus fetch. Now, I don't have evidence of that and Rishabh's benchmarks have not, not even attempted to test that. But we have at least one user who says, no, it's much faster if you just use clone. So that's something we could do, definitely do before thinking of implementing it clone. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So, Rishab, to, to Oleg's earlier question on the release plan, uh, we, we certainly will do a release, including the, the changes. Um, we're excited by them, looking forward to them, expect it. If not, a portion of the changes will probably release within the next week or two. And the full set shortly, if not by the end of the project, shortly thereafter. Sure, uh, that will be it, Mark. Okay. Looking forward to it. Okay, there is no other questions. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. And I suggest to move on. So the next presenter is uh, uh, Kaja and uh, he will present GitHub Checks API for Jenkins plugins. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. So can you see my screen now? Yes. 
So, hello everyone, I'm Koji. I'm going to talk about the GitHub Checks API plugin and my mentors are Wuli and Ting. So, first, um, we have added some features from FIS1 and first we have a general API and uh, now we host it in the Checks API plugin. And we also added an implementation for the GitHub Checks API. We host it in the GitHub Checks plugin and we now have released both of the plugins. Um, you can search them in the, GitHub, in, in the plugin market, and uh, uh, we released the, we, we release the 0.1 version, and looking forward to our first installation in the user. Mm, so uh, in phase two, we actually use the uh, checks API in practice, and uh, first we use it in the warnings plugin, uh, we use it to report the quality gate. As you can see, there are many green checks and the red X here. They represent the quality gate from the uh, from the different tools. And uh, here's the messages uh, like the uh, new issues or no new issues when total. And if you want to see more details, we'll show you some uh, severity about the issue statistics and. Uh, the next thing is about the annotations. Uh, here you can see it is the check style wording and it's a parameter number check. The severity is normal and uh, the message. And in the row output, you will see some um, row messages from the uh, tools report. Normally it's XML. So you will see some tags here. And uh, let's go to the link. So that's the checks page and you'll see here are the two different tools and we will only show the annotations for the new warnings for the new issues because if we i show the total issues there will be too many like maybe cpd sometimes more than 100 or for a big project and uh, if you want to see the annotations on the code you just click this button here and you will see these annotations along the code. So like check style or PMD. So that's those annotations, just like the review comment. And, uh, and, uh, and now we have already merged this feature in the warnings plugin. If you want to try it, you just need to update the warnings plugin to 8.4.0 and uh, also instead of the checks API plugin and the GitHub checks plugin and they just use this uh, warnings plugin in the project that you use this GitHub branch SM, maybe a multi branch project or a GitHub organization project but if you feel um, uh, this feel, feel terrible about this feature, and if you feel terrible about to uh, see so many warnings or issues uh, for your code, uh, you can definitely disable it, and you can uh, skip the pipeline checks just like other options, and you can also skip it in the, in the pipeline script. Uh, in default, we uh, enable this feature. And the next part is the code coverage API plugin. Uh, we use that to first to report the coverage trend. So in the message part, you will say uh, like the nine branch, like the line coverage uh, against the target branch. Uh, normally it's the master branch and you will say the uh, branch coverage against the not successful view. And there will be some links to the reference view. And uh, also you will have a coverage healthy score. Um, you, you can um, control this score by setting the threshold for the coverage um, when, when configure the, the plugin. And we also add some details about different coverages like report uh, group, but uh, most useful I believe is line and the conditional. Uh, this conditional is just the branch coverage, which is used as conditional in the coverage API plugin. And you'll see the trend. The trend is compared with the last successful build. And here's the link. Oh, sorry, it's not a link. So 
So here is a short message in the details. So target links will direct you to the reference field. And here is a, a link to the coverages uh, action page. So um, the coverage API uh, report uh, coverage in recursive way, but uh, we believe it's too, too complicated. If we uh, use such a recursive style in the GitHub UI, there would be uh, too many of those reports. So, and uh, this is the reference field. Mm -hmm. No, the okay. So now I'm going to show the demo. Okay, so first I'm going to uh, show the, the how the warnings plugin works for these checks. I will delete this build to ensure those issues are still new compared with the last build. So in the GitHub site, you will see some warnings like this is queued. And uh, those those checks are just uh, made uh, in my previous checks. So, just wait a moment. In the console, it should be so those. Processes still. So let's talk about the labels first. Okay. So for uh, so I want to first talk about the plan for phase three. So we are, we are add the pipeline support, and we will also add the rerun request through the checks API and some other uh, tweaks for this plugin. Okay. So let's see whether it has complicated. So now it's uh, uh, collecting the Java warnings. So the Java warnings. succeeded now you'll see this is uh, uh, newly made but there's no issues so so if you say check style this is it just now and still those new version new issues So any questions or any suggestions for our plugins? Any anything on the UI or functions or Yeah, you said that you're gonna be working on rerun. Does that just rerun uh like the pipeline or the job? Or is that like something yeah, else? The, the, the whole job, just the whole job. Okay. Whole build. Cool. Yeah, for that we already have a plugin uh, which is based on uh, command ops. So there mm -hmm. is a GitHub command plugin, if I recall correctly. Uh, but yeah, this plugin isn't very active at the moment. But if you plan something more complicated, yeah, it would be awesome. And yeah, for the <laughs> record, uh, even this demo, it looks great. I'm looking yeah. forward to update my instances. Okay. Actually, it, it Besides the rerun, you can and um, you can make many actions through the check API, um, like uh, maybe automatically format the code. You can uh, mix that action, and the users just click it in the GitHub, and they, uh, and they just implement those actions in Jenkins. So. Yeah, really nice. Good job. 
in terms of um, where it's at, um, so Warnings NG was released this morning with this, um, and code coverage is still in a pull request waiting for review at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but you can use the Warnings NG side of it already. Yeah, thanks to team. Uh, we already started discussion about uh, adopting uh, this feature on um, the CI Jenkins IO. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it will be soon available to Jenkins plugin developers and contributors. It is hopefully thanks to Uli and team for working on uh, pipeline library patches. Yeah, it was a long road to get uh, this pull request merged, but mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully we will get it uh, over the line uh, so that we have something to show to Jenkins contributors as well. Okay, so now stop sharing my screen. Cool. And the other thing, just what pipeline support means here um, is that it'll be things like steps that users can do to, can use to add their own um, checks. So inside of their pipeline or their pipeline library, they can easily interact with the checks API. Okay. Yeah, warnings and G is our key to all the static analysis features and Jenkins. So yeah, just by supporting one plugin, we actually uh, support a huge number of use cases right away. And yeah, with code coverage API, I think. Yeah, yeah, the pipeline support will be nice for, for some of the custom use cases too. I agree. Personally, I still want to have access to the yes, it's API. a non-waiting feature. Well, for what it was, uh, Keja has already documented it in the phase one blog post, right? So if you open uh, the blog post, you can see that, uh, yeah, there is a sample how to do that. Um, but yeah, if there is some optimization, of course, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or comments? No. Uh, then thanks a lot for the presentation. And um, yep, if anyone is interested, please try out the feature uh, so that uh, you can get more feedback and uh, do more testing. Um, the next phase. Okay, thank you. All. Okay. Slide in. Oh, sorry, Sumit. Are you on? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I'll just. Is my screen visible? Yes. Um, awesome. I guess I've already seen this desktop today. <laughs> So, um, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining this presentation. Um, so, we'll be presenting today the external storage, uh, the external fingerprint storage project, which is one of the projects uh, under GSOC and Jenkins this year. And uh, I'm very glad to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, I, uh, thanks, I want to extend my thanks to all the mentors, uh, Oleg, Andre, Mike. Um, so, they've been awesome uh, with helping me out with this project. So I'll uh, begin this presentation. Um, so we have a number of topics for the agenda. I started with a small personal introduction. So I'm Sumit, I'm one of those two. I'm, I'm the student for this project and uh, I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in instrumentation and control engineering. Um, I started contributing to Jenkins in December, 2019. Um, and I started with the fingerprints engine and that's why uh, it led me to, you know, being part of this project. Um, so I'll just do a quick phase one recap because I think uh, there are new people also and uh, that would help everybody get familiar with what exactly fingerprints are. So file fingerprinting inside Jenkins is a way to uh, basically uh, allow uh, tracking which version of a file or build is being used uh, inside the Jenkins ecosystem, right? So just as a small example, say team A builds A.jar and team B builds B.jar, right? Uh, and B.jar has a dependency on A.jar and team B finds that, you know, there's some issue in B.jar so team A needs to fix it and uh, now team A needs to figure out which particular version of B.jar they're using, right? So fingerprinting engine allows this version tracking to happen across jobs and builds, you know? So you can uh, basically fingerprint your artifacts or files, anything that's related uh, to these, uh, these uh, artifacts that are being created by builds, right? 
So I'll just show a small uh, example to show exactly how this UI inside fingerprint uh, exists, right? So uh, I have, over here, I have two jobs, right? A and B. And what B does is uh, it copies the artifact that A produces, right? So if I just trigger a build of for A, right? Um, and I, I look, I can see here that I can go to C fingerprints, right? And it has, it's producing the artifact A.txt. And I can see that its usage has been in uh, job A's build number three, right? Um, and if I trigger the, uh, you know, a build for B and I go to C fingerprints, I can see that it's, it has a.txt whose original owner was the, uh, was created by, uh, job A's build three. And I can see all the versions where this particular artifact was used. So that's just a small intro to, uh, the fingerprinting engine inside Jenkins. Um, so yeah, so we saw the UI. Um, so just, uh, what we did in phase one, um, so what the disadvantage with the current fingerprint engine is that, uh, it's, um, uh, it's basically storing these fingerprint files inside the local storage. And as we move towards a cloud native Jenkins, we want to externalize the storage of fingerprints, right? So, uh, the main idea behind this project is to, uh, was to be, you know, provide an API that can allow external, the plugins to come in and they can support, you know, different types of storage plugins, like a Redis plugin, a MySQL finger print storage plugin and these fingerprints can then be stored inside these instances and uh, basically the dependence on the disk storage of Jenkins uh, lessons right um, and uh, you know so we built the Redis fingerprint storage plugin in phase one and uh, we created that API in Jenkins core and we released it in Jenkins 2.242 and we have a JEP for it right so JEP 2.26 you can go and uh, so we have all the design decisions listed there so um, what did we do this phase right um, so one of the stories we targeted in this phase of fingerprint clean fingerprint cleanup. So what happens is, uh, in, in, so what earlier used to happen, you know, in the local storage was that, uh, sometimes what can happen is that, uh, builds get deleted from Jenkins, right? And if, uh, a fingerprint, ha uh, does not have any, uh, you know, pointer to any build that it does not make sense to store it. Right. So we need to delete that, uh, fingerprint because then it's just occupying extra space. So this is a periodic job that happens on Jenkins, uh, which cleans up these builtless fingerprints. Uh, but that, that, uh, capability, uh, we are not exposed to the external storages. So now this, uh, feature is now implemented. Um, so we have introduced new methods for API in the API for plugin developers. So they can, uh, so now the plugin has to implement, uh, you know, iterate and clean up fingerprints and basically they can iterate these fingerprints. Uh, uh, Jenkins will enter it, uh, this method will be called by Jenkins core and the plugin, uh, it's up to the plugin to, you know, clean these fingerprints. And we have provided these, uh, the clean fingerprint method that can be called right for cleaning that fingerprint. Um, so we released this feature, uh, in Jenkins 2.24 six, uh, actually 2.248 because that build, uh, there's some problems. So, uh, so yeah, it, it was in 2.248. Uh, so fingerprint cleanup, um, uh, and this particular API was, is then, you know, uh, consumed by the Redis fingerprint storage plugin. This is the reference implementation that we work on simultaneously. So, uh, inside the, in the plugin, we actually use cursor. So basically now we need to, you know, uh, crawl the entire fingerprint database, uh, inside Redis. So, you know, um, uh, we use cursors because uh, they, uh, we get an added advantage that they don't block. So it's not a blocking operation and uh, you know, uh, that it's better than actually uh, you're doing something like a fetch all. So, so that's how we implemented cleanup inside uh, Redis fingerprint cleanup. And uh, also we gave the uh, users the, uh, uh, you know, feature to disable fingerprint cleanup because uh, since these fingerprints are now in an external storage and external storages are, you know, a lot of times uh, many, uh, they're very cheap. So it makes sense, you know, to actually not have uh, an extra uh, performance overhead. So, so it's now up to the users to actually, you know, uh, they can, if they want, they can disable cleanup, fingerprint cleanup. Uh, it's up to them. So fingerprint cleanup was one of the stories we targeted. Um, another story we targeted was fingerprint migration. So earlier, um, with the Redis plugin, what happens was, what happened was, uh, inside, in fact, with any uh, storage plugin or whatsoever. So, um, the old fingerprints that are already in the system. And then, you know, you, you go ahead and you install the Redis fingerprint storage plugin. What happens to the old fingerprints? So uh, earlier they used to remain on the system and that was a drawback. Now we have implemented migration. Uh, how we've done it is basically we have, uh, uh, 
implemented a kind of lazy migration. So whenever these fingerprints are used, uh, we transfer them to the new external storage. So, you know, we don't create huge performance bottlenecks where we are, you know, taking along, uh, we're transferring all the fingerprints from the local storage to the external storage at one go. So that's uh, fingerprint migration. It's not yet released. It's uh, it's still under review in Jenkins code, uh, right? Um, and then there was fingerprint storage descriptor, right? So earlier, uh, what happened with the Redis plugin? And uh, so basically, um, we uh, now we have introduced fingerprint storage descriptor, which allows uh, you know the plugins to be actually configured from this drop down. So earlier, uh, as soon as the plugin was installed, the storage was uh, changed by default. So there was no option to you know toggle these storages. Now, uh, basically, with the drop down, you can actually choose. You know, you can even have multiple storages installed, but you can choose one that you want, right? So that was uh, some sort of refactoring that we did. And so this was released in 2.2 um, And we improved the testing for the Redis plugin. So we introduced connection tests, authorization tests, web UI tests. Uh, we ensured that, you know, configuration as code is also, uh, so basically you can use Jcask to configure the plugin. Um, so we introduced those tests also. Um, uh, with achievements, you know, so as I said, uh, we clean up API and story descriptor was released in 2.2.4.8. Um, and uh, the plugins uh, point one, uh, uh, 0.1 RC2 re uh, release uh, has also happened. So now um, you can directly install the plugins on the update center, uh, right? So, so yeah, we have now we now have the plugin on the uh, plugins.jenkins.io also, and um, yeah, so and we have uh, had two RC releases. So yeah, that's. Uh, um, so please, I would recommend everybody to go ahead, uh, check this plugin out. Um, let us know, you know, if you get face any bugs, any issues. Um, and next, so I now I'll move on to the demo. So whatever I talked about, you know, so how how the uh, so that we can see how it happens, right? Um, so so right. Um, what I'll do is uh, quickly I'll create a new item. So I'll create a job. It's called demo. Uh, I'll make it a freestyle project. And uh, I'll add a build step to uh, execute shell. There's an echo hi uh, into demo dot text, right? And then I'll add a post build uh, action for uh, recording fingerprints. So for the demo dot txt file, uh, and I'll hit apply and I'll hit save, right? So now um, I have this job, right? B uh, demo. Uh, so at the moment, I don't have an external storage configured. So this is the local storage, right? So if I uh, start a build for this and uh, just a quick question, you can see this screen also, right? Awesome. Um, so um, let's go ahead and see where this fingerprint is, right? So right now in my fingerprints folder, I have two fingerprints. Um, so let's see this. One. Right. So this is the demo fingerprint that just got created. And we can see that it was used in build one for demo. Right. Uh, so now I'll take you to the configuration. So if you go to the configuration page for Jenkins, uh, I have the plugin already installed. So inside the fingerprints, you know, uh, so the first, so one of the implementation I talked about, right, was this descriptor that we made. So now Redis fingerprint storage can be selected right from this menu. And uh, before I actually configure this, uh, I'll just uh, start a local Redis server on my machine, right? Um, in fact, right, so I have a server running here and I'll just uh, start a command line interface to the uh, server. So if I see which uh, fingerprints I have, so it's empty right now, right? Um, and now if I do a test Redis connection, I get a success, right? So now I can go ahead and um, hit apply and hit save. So now, um, you know, the external fingerprint storage is configured. So ideally what should happen, right? What, what we want to happen. So if uh, we may, if we go back here, I can still see this fingerprint, right? So this is in the local storage. So as soon as I run this build, uh, this should get used. Uh, so basically this fingerprint gets used. So it should get migrated to the external storage. So I'll just hit uh, build for this. Right, so I get build two, and if I just quickly see the fingerprints here, uh, that everything is working fine. So yeah, I'm getting two builds have used this particular fingerprint, and if I go here, um, 
right? So if you just notice that fingerprint got deleted, I have just one fingerprint now, which is from earlier. And if I hit the server, I have now have entry for this fingerprint. So if I just do a get, I can see this fingerprint now in the Redis server. So this was uh, what exactly I talked about when I mentioned migration that we have implemented. Um, third thing was cleanup, right? So if I go back to the configuration page, um, so yeah, so this is the option for, you know, disabling fingerprint. So at the moment fingerprint cleanup uh, is disabled. So I'll just go ahead and enable it. Uh, and I'll hit apply and I'll hit save. Um, hey, so at the moment, no cleanup should happen because, you know, uh, that fingerprint has two builds associated with it. So what I'll do is I'll just delete these builds. Right. Um, and I'll delete build number one also. Now, if I go back, you know, so there's no build associated with that fingerprint. And now if I go ahead and query, uh, it's gone, right? So fingerprint cleanup uh, happens. Just a small side note, um, fingerprint cleanup happens daily. So once in a day, but I'm just running, uh, you know, for the demo purposes, I have just uh, uh, decreased that interval. So it's now happening every, happening every 10 seconds. So that's why it happened so quickly. Um, so that's the fingerprint cleanup API that I talked about in my presentation. Uh, right. um, yeah, so that was about it. What we did this phase. Um, next step is, uh, you know, uh, working on a new reference implementation. So yeah, I think uh, as you can guess, uh, we're going with Postgres this time. And there's a new set of challenges that come with Postgres because, um, so basically till now we store these fingerprints as blobs, right? And uh, that's, uh, you know, a more easier than a relational database. And we want to decouple this, right? So uh, basically uh, what we are trying to do is, you know, define some certain schema to these fingerprints and, uh, you know, um, store them in uh, a relational database. What, what this will allow is, uh, one is that, you know, uh, um, you can uh, use this Postgres plugin and plus it uh, for new implementation uh, developers, new plugin developers, who, if they want to use, you know, a reference, uh, uh, a relational database, so they can then use this reference plugin uh, to build more plugins, right? So that's our idea for the uh, Postgres plugin and, you know, some things that are farther away, maybe are tracing, same. Uh, so basically, um, just, you know, we get the, so basically what tracing is that, um, uh, this, these uh, storages are, uh, so this plugin uh, and the API is made in such a way that multiple Jenkins instances can be configured to a single storage. So now this allows us, you know, it grants us this huge opportunity to trace these fingerprints across Jenkins instances. So that is something, you know, uh, might be worth exploring, uh, maybe farther down the line. So yeah, that's, I think about it from my side and, uh, before I start the q and I just have some links at the last page if anybody wants to check them out. So I'll open up uh, the discussion for Q&A. Um, Thanks for the presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, so my classic Question, uh, does anybody use fingerprint on uh, the instances? Uh, maybe you should, uh, but yeah. <laughs> so I think that uh, it's a great improvement uh, to the plug storage ecosystem because yeah, when we talk to developers and the developer mailing list, people say they don't use fingerprints, but when we look at use statistics, actually many people actually have a file of fingerprints, credentials fingerprints enabled. And I believe that with uh, better storage, but uh, user experience, we can actually provide uh, great uh, traceability and observability features to Jenkins. So, yeah, for me, this uh, project uh, yeah, looks uh, really interesting and yeah, I'm happy to see how it works. I already migrated my personal instance to Redis fingerprint storage. And yes, I use fingerprints, uh, so it works really well. So, uh, Sumit, are there any things that you have learned from 
this that we should apply in general to the externalization of other storage components as well. Certainly there are lots of places where Jenkins stores things that we would consider doing externalization. Are there any things that you need to share? Thankfully, you've got Oleg as your mentor, so he's had lots of experience in that space. Uh, right, so uh, yeah, uh, so with the cloud native server, I think this is an area for active, you know, uh, where um, a lot of uh, stories are happening for this. Fingerprints was one of them um, to for uh, you know, so I think uh, the answer to that question is probably that, yeah, we, uh, so I think um, one of the facets for that answer is that, yes, we figured out how to, you know, make these APIs and, uh, um, you know, uh, as in, as in uh, we develop more plugins and we add more features, we realize that how well um, or how bad our original API was. So I think that API can act as a, you know, a reference to the future uh, externalization stories. Um, but I also think that another facet is that, you know, uh, all these stories are unique in their own sense. Um, some of these stories, you know, uh, are, are more difficult to implement with, uh, you know, that certain consoles, if you go to configurations, you need them at startup. So that's another challenge. So I think all of them, uh, have separate challenges associated with them, but, uh, yes, I, I think, uh, as far as learning goes, um, yeah, I think we made us a decent API and uh, I think, you know, time will tell how, uh, you know, if it's uh, holds well or not. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's yeah, it's think... in progress or coming soon. Sorry? Yeah, I was, that's all, I was just saying that, that that sounds really good. Just that this table needs, needs a good update. Um, uh, yeah, it's on my list. Uh, I actually started updating the Cloud Native Seek. We just started it uh, in May. But yeah, right after we started, we went on a kind of summer break. Although we have a few meetings uh, planned for August. Stay tuned. Uh, but yeah, all these materials will be audit, updated. Example for configurations. Yeah, now I would rather say that we have Jenkins configuration as code. I'm not sure whether we really want to invest in the pluggable configuration storage. Uh, it's a subject for the discussion, but other stories still need to be implemented. And uh, for me, fingerprints is actually a great story because firstly, it's um, isolated. So it can be done in a feasible amount of time, like Sumit demonstrated during this project. It still provides us uh, a lot of insights and experience how it could be done uh, as plugins, with database, with API changes. So architecturally wise, I think that uh, this project is already a total success. And yeah, thanks to Sumit, we already have everything uh, landed in the Jenkins score. So now it's a matter of reference implementation and a matter of additional features we could get out of that. Because, for example, querying fingerprints uh, for data, like, let's say, uh, querying by timestamps, querying by particular events, it's just not possible with file system storage unless you load all data in the memory. But with external fingerprint storage, it becomes possible. And hence, we can uh, explore how we can utilize it in Jenkins. And yeah, bonus points for multi-Jenkins instance support which is also available in external fingerprint storage. Thank you, Oleg. So, I wonder so, what if we could switch to agent to say, oh, to read this, but yeah, we can definitely discuss it later. So I think even if you didn't clean up fingerprints, if you were to remove old builds, you would, you would lose some of that traceability though, right? So I think once we would need some pluggable external storage for that in order for that to work for like prune builds, right? Well, it's yes and no, because it really depends on how you implement uh, storage. Because with the current uh, design, fingerprints uh, remain available until there is uh, one reference, at least one reference. And uh, yeah, it means that uh, if there is no reference, it can be garbage collector. But uh, if there is a reference, uh, then uh, all the information remains available. And what hmm. we did uh, as a part of uh, application period to JSOC, actually there was already an API added by Sumit in order to make it possible to prevent deletion of fingerprints. Cool. So for example, 
say you want to recover a Docker traceability plugin, and uh, the ones I do that, I would definitely uh, happily use uh, all these APIs in order to provide a better experience to users. Nice. So if I understood correctly, like if you had Java that had 3,000 runs and it pruned after 500, but you had job B that was referring to that and only had five and all of its runs were there, then yeah. the traceability from the first run from job A would, like that fingerprint would still be there. Yeah, probably. it will be still there. Uh, some data will be there because fingerprint stores its own data, which makes it challenging, for example, for fingerprint storage, because yes, it basically stores arbitrary data without fixed structure. Uh, hence, yeah, keeping it in a relational database is not trivial. And I'm looking forward to see how we resolve it during the next phase. Well, we like already cool. have a good design for that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, just, you know, so these, these fingerprints have, uh, you can add a facet to them. And once there is a facet and it can decide if it wants to block the deletion for the fingerprint. So if that happens, then, you know, uh, even cleanup won't delete it. If you have such a facet that is blocking the deletion. So, so that is one way to ensure that, you know, that fingerprint never gets deleted. So, any other uh, questions or comments? If not, thanks to everyone. And yeah, we did uh, this meeting in time. Uh, so, yeah, just to repeat what we discussed in the beginning of the meetup, if you have any questions, we have a JSON Gitter channel. Uh, you can ask there or feel free to contact us using any other community channel. And yeah, we ask all students to actually update the project pages so that uh, all the materials and recordings are linked from there and that participants can easily uh, discover these materials. Okay, any closing comments, questions? Looks like not. So then uh, join us uh, tomorrow. Uh, we will have uh, another session with uh, three presentations. And uh, yeah, thanks to all students, mentors, and other contributors who work on JSOC. Yeah, it's just the middle of the project, but uh, we can already see great demos by all the students. And it's a pleasure to see how uh, the project evolves uh, this year. Thank you to everyone, students, mentors, and contributors. Thanks. Well, see you tomorrow. I'll stop the recording. Bye.